yourself. Pray for multiplication through your life and ministry and for me. Lord, I trust you really to assume your lordship and assert your lordship in this room tonight in each one of us. I pray that you will move in us and you'll not just be a silent partner, but you could be. You could just withdraw and become silent in us. David prayed that be not silent unto me, O Lord, lest if you become silent unto me, I become like one who goes down into the pit. The most important thing that occurs is when you speak to us, because then options are there. And I pray that you'll speak to us tonight. Be not silent to us. Favor us with your communication. And especially give us listening ears and hearts. Give us what uh, Alan mentioned Luke 24, open our understanding so that we can understand the scriptures and work the miracle of illumination in us. And as, as I share tonight, I pray that the words of Paul will echo in all of our minds. Consider what I say and the Lord give you understanding in all things. And it begins just with human consideration of human communication. And hopefully you come through that trust you to do that for your perfect purpose. Now anoint your word and anoint our hearts and our lips for your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, two weeks ago we talked about, what did we talk about? I want somebody to tell me. In our last time together. Did I say? Yeah. Taking the roof off. All right, taking the roof off. <laughs> you have to explain that. <laughs> when they lowered the man down through the roof. Raised the roof, didn't they? Yeah. Okay, so what what was the main theme of that one? Somebody taking someone to somewhere. What's the main theme? Men taking another man to Jesus. To Jesus. Okay, tonight we're going to talk about <coughs> Jesus being carried where he needs to go. We're going to take the other direction. So take your Bible and turn to Matthew 21. I, I've had this study a long time, but I don't often use it. And, and every time I use it, the Lord rebukes me for not using it because it's a, it's a very vivid picture. And I, some of my favorite stories are donkey stories. And they don't use the word donkey. <laughs> Because, of that. I mean, they're very vivid. I have favorite stories, favorite preacher stories, favorite church stories. And uh, they, they always swim to mind when I come to this passage. We're going to see Jesus, we're going to see God, the Holy Spirit, recruiting donkeys tonight. I'm just finishing in my own quiet time every morning. I've been doing it for a year now. A study of the book of Job. One of the key lines was when God restored him, he gave him all this cattle, and at the mm. tail end of the list, he gave him a thousand donkeys. Mm. Now, how'd you like to have to keep up with a thousand donkeys? <laughs> the upkeep of a thousand donkeys. And that was only part of the estate God restored him with. A thousand donkeys. Well, when I think of, when I put that text with this one, I, I, I urgently want to ask the Lord to recruit a thousand and donkeys. And you'll see what that means when we go through this tonight. This is Matthew 21. We're going to begin with verse 1, and we'll go through verse 11. And I'm reading from the King James Bible, and I'm, I'm appreciative. I noticed that at least there's no, one other translation. I think there may be two or three <coughs> other translations in the room even here tonight, but I'm reading from the King James Bible. Verse 1 says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage. Now, Bethphage is just on the back side of the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem. So it's east of the city. So this will let you know what direction they're coming from. They came to Beth Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives. Then sent Jesus two disciples. Now, I want you, if you don't mind marking in your Bible, why don't you draw a circle around the verb in the last sentence there. Jesus sent two disciples. The verb sent. 
And then in verse 6, skip to verse 6 and draw a circle around the verb went. Now that ought to be the succession of every child of God. Every child of God is sent. There's just no way to get into it without being sent. Mm -hmm. He said, as the Father has sent me, even so, and it's exact ratio. Means like he sent me, that's the way he wants to send you. Where he sent me, that's where he wants to send you. In other words, a similar exact ratio of similarity. And in my full dependence on the Holy Spirit, you're to be sent fully dependent upon the Holy Spirit. All the dimensions of that, that's in John 20, 21. All right, connect those two verbs. Just draw a line if you don't mind, or you can easily see it when you study it. But his sin will lead to our went. In other words, when sent occurs, went ought to occur. So sent and went ought to go together. This is just the nature of the gospel, the nature of the calling, the nature of the creature in being saved. So it says, then sent Jesus two disciples. Now, I would guess they were Peter and John, but that would be a guess. And he said unto them, go into the village over against you, just think of the devotional concepts that come swimming to the surface when you just pause a minute. What that suggests is that everything Jesus needs is not out of, what everything he needs to use for his ministry is not out of reach of any one of us. He said, go into the village over against you and straightway, that word means immediately, no search will be necessary when I book, when I'm your booking agent. Straightway or immediately you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say anything to you, ought unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled. Now, pause a minute. The word fulfilled. Tell me, Jim. Uh, Verse 4. Major emphasis. Major emphasis. Okay, the word fulfilled. You want to note that. The word actually means exactly what it says. Filled up full. So now you're going to see a statement of Old Testament prophecy that is like a container, like a bucket. And now you're going to see it filled brim full with the content it was written for. So it says, this was done, this is one of Matthew's key expressions, he was the writer of the fulfilled prophecy. He calls attention again and again, just like this, to ways Jesus fulfilled prophecy of the Old Testament. All this was done that it might be filled up full, which was spoken by the prophet, this is in Zechariah 9, verse 9, saying, tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. Now, let me pause to give you a little grammar lesson here, because that could be a little confusing. What does that sound like, the last part of verse 5, when you just read it on the surface? Yeah, it sounds like he's riding both of them. In fact, that's what the English says, mm -hmm. sitting upon an ass and a colt. But the, 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 um, the Greek conjunction, chi, means either and or even. Now you need to remember that because when you run into places where it doesn't like this, the, the translation doesn't make sense. He did, he'd did. be a circus rider standing up on both those beasts with one foot on one one on the other riding them or some such manner if that were the case. No, this word means even. It's the same word, and it translates either by and or even. Here's, so here's what that says. Sitting upon an ass, even a colt, the fold of an ass. So it was the younger one that he was sitting on. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. I like that. John Wesley said, his commands are not to be mended, they're to be minded. So they just simply obeyed him. He sent, they went. 
disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought an ass, brought the ass and the coat and put on them their clothes. In other words, they began to take off their outer garments and put on both animals, supposedly, apparently, to provide him something of a saddle. And also they stroke, one of the gospels says, the clothes and the palm branches on the street in front of them, in front of them, so that he could ride on them. In other words, they put everything down there. Put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread, and this is major emphasis, their garments in the way. In other words, they didn't get something else. They actually took off their own outer garments and spread them in the street. Others cut down branches from the trees and strode them in the way. So apparently they put everything they could find under his feet. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried saying, Hosanna, that's a specialized word, it means save now. So there's some messianic waves in the air here. That's a term of acclamation. Save now to the Son of David. Now that is a given Messianic title, Son of David. So the Messianic pitch is reach fever pitch. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, and that word moved is minor emphasis. <clears throat> all the city was moved, and I'm not going to tell you yet what that is, but don't let me forget to tell you later what that word is. It's a big one. When he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, that's an imperfect tense verb, they kept on saying, now, please note, they had a major question in front of them, and they gave a mild, minor answer. Their answer was not satisfactory. Mm -hmm. right. it, it, was, it was very inadequate. It wasn't inaccurate. It was just inadequate. This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Now, I'm assuming they went to the limit of their light, but their light was not nearly far. So we're going to do a cameo sketch of that donkey that carried Jesus. Um, it's interesting to see how the donkey has become a proverb. Somebody give me a proverb that has the word mule in it. He's as stubborn, stubborn as a mule. Oh, you talking about it. Yeah, a proverb that has a, no, not a biblical proverb. It's a proverb that has a mule in it. There are a lot of them. Oh, there are a lot of them, they, and they don't all use the word mule, <laughs> but there are a lot of them that have the, 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 the mule in it. There are two Bible stories that put donkeys in good lights, mm -hmm. positive lights. Mm -hmm. One's in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. one's in the New Testament. Now, you remember that a genuine prophet of God defaulted and was about to disobey God big time was riding a donkey, and the donkey was, star was smarter than the preacher. <laughs> Not very flattering. The donkey was smarter than the preacher. So when uh, Balaam tried to get the donkey to carry him to the place where he's going to make the false prophecy against the people of God, the donkey did three things. First, he turned out of the way into a field. Balaam had to flog him back up onto the pathway. Then he ran into a wall, deliberately found a wall, ran into a wall and crushed the prophet's foot. He had to flog him again back out in the center of the pathway. And then the donkey talked. <laughs> so Balaam sort of lost his argument then. But now, let me give you a proverb of my own. When the prophet turned ass, the ass turned prophet. <laughs> That's not the only time in history that has occurred. Amen. I look at myself and wonder how many times in the world I've turned ass as, as God's appointed prophet. And I think I've been probably rebuked and opposed by something as bad as a donkey sometimes 
and, and had to stop and just take bearings on all of it and repent just like Balaam was, was to have done. So we're going to isolate <coughs> the most renowned donkey undoubtedly in history. I, I can't think of this passage. I had a couple in one of my early churches, in my second church after seminary, that uh, they made a six-week trip around the world. They were very wealthy. When they came home, they showed their pictures, and and almost every one of their pictures had donkeys in them. <laughs> and to show you how they did not know where they were, they had a picture of the Taj Mahal with a donkey out front, and they didn't even know what the Taj Mahal was. They just talked about the donkey. <laughs> so donkey can be commanding. Uh, I want to give you several concepts here. Number one, there is a spiritual concept heart of this story. A spiritual concept. And the spiritual concept is that Jesus needs carriers if he's going to get where he wants to go. He cannot get where he wants to go without carriers. Put in your notes under at number one, verse three. Verse three. Middle of verse 3, he said, If any man asks you any question about why you're taking this donkey, say, The Lord has need of these two animals. Jesus needs carriers. He cannot get to where he wants to go without carriers. Now, there are, there are several things that indicate this biblically. Number one, the clear statement of scripture says so we just quoted that verse from Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 repeated in verses 4 and 5 and it indicates that the statement of scripture proves that Jesus has to have carriers here's the second thing the symbols of scripture prove that Jesus has to have carriers now this would be a limitless study there are many of them in the Bible. Let me give you two classic ones. One is in John chapter 15, and this will be very familiar, the vine and the branches passage. John 15, verses 1 through 8 in particular. Now, what is the purpose of a branch? The purpose of a branch is to carry the life of the vine. That's the primary reason for the existence of a branch. Its only concern is its point of connection with the vine. If the, if the point of connection is broken, the branch cannot fulfill its purpose. Because its only purpose is to carry the life of the vine. Now, it carries it to the point that when the branch itself is saturated, and there's no place for the sap then to go, it breaks out in fruit. That's the purpose of a Christian, to carry the life of Christ, free flow within him, so that when he gets saturated, the next move is that Jesus breaks out through him, producing fruit, and the vine, the branch, the Christian, gets to bear the fruit that he produces. We do not produce the fruit. He produces it, we bear it, because he's the vine, and it's the life of the vine flowing in the branch, produces the fruit and the branch bears the fruit. The vine, the stalk itself does not bear the fruit. The branch does. So we have a clearly assigned massive place in this entire economy. So there's one symbol that shows that Jesus needs carriers, the vine and the branches. Here's another one. That massive picture of the church throughout the epistles as the body of Christ proves that Jesus needs carriers. What is, a, what is a body for? My body exists to provide a vehicle for the carrying of the invisible person who lives on the inside of my body. Let me say that again. My body exists to provide a vehicle for the carrying and the releasing of the invisible person who lives inside of me. You have never seen me. I don't know that you'll ever see me. Maybe in eternity, I don't know. 
but you've never seen me. You've only seen my revelation of myself by the way I use my body. That's all you've ever seen. It's all I've ever seen of you. You are an invisible personality living in a visible body, and the way you deploy the use of your body is the way you reveal who you are and what you're about. Use your tongue, use your eyes, use your ears, use your hands, use your feet to release yourself, reveal yourself. Now, how does the body operate? Well, it doesn't have any intelligence below the chin. This hand doesn't have any intelligence, but look at it. It looks like it's over control. How's it doing that? It doesn't have any intelligence. All the intelligence is in the head. But there's a set of nerves outgoing one set. They're called afferents. They're called efferents. And incoming another set called afferents. And down from the brain to the hand goes a signal that says, hold yourself out there, palm up, spread like that, and stay there until I tell you to do otherwise. Now, if my body's healthy, the hand obeys. And then it sends back a signal up the other set of nerves, afferent nerves, and it says, mission accomplished, I wait further orders. Now, if there, I don't have anything for it to do, it's on its own. The gravity takes over and just hangs at my side. Now, this is precisely the way the body of Christ is supposed to operate. It requires sensitized, constant connection with the head of the body. The head of the body is in heaven, Jesus himself, and there's a connecting device between him and us. That's what prayers for manual of study that gives the orders, the, the Bible, and he gives the orders and the body is to obey. But the symbol of the church is the body of Christ indicates that he needs carriers. So this is gigantic. Here's the third thing that indicates he needs carriers. All the active saints of history prove that Jesus needs carriers. That he cannot get where he wants to go without somebody carrying him. 1,600 years ago, Aurelius Augustine was perhaps the greatest history, uh, theologian in the history of the church, made this very simple statement. I hope you'll write this down. He said, without God, we cannot. Without God, we cannot. But without us, he will not. See, this is that interchange of divine human cooperation. It's the very it's the way the movement works. Who said it? Aurelius Augustine, the theologian Augustine. He was renowned in history by one name. This guy who went to North Africa and got converted. His mother begged him not to go, and she was praying for him all the time, but God outdid her and sent him down there, and he met a priest down there that was instrumental. And then he heard he was in the garden one day and heard some kids across the fence say, take up and read, and it smote him like an arrow, and he rushed in and got a Bible that let it fall open and fell open at Romans 13. He was saved at the end of the chapter. In that room after hearing those kids chanting outside, take up and read. They didn't mean that. He didn't know they didn't mean that. God used that to reach him. He said, without God, we cannot. The greatest theologian in the history of the church. He said, without God, we cannot. Without us, God will not. Uh, another of my missionary heroes is a man named Wilfred Grenfell. <coughs> Grenfell was a brilliant, young, London medical doctor. I mean, brilliant. Graduated the top of his class and could have cut his ticket. He immediately broke into practice in London. He was raised by Christian parents, but when he started learning in medical school, he had been baptized as a child, but he was never saved, like many. And um, and D. L. Moody came to do a crusade in London with his team, and he promised his parents he would go one night, and they set the date. They were praying and praying and praying. But when the night came, there was he was treating a woman who was pregnant and labor started and he had to cancel the trip to the meeting and he had to go down into that area of London and make a house call to, <coughs> to get to this woman. And he, he parked his vehicle uh, some distance away and was walking down into the area when he heard the sound of hymns, Christian hymns. He was drawn aside 
and that they had put up a big tent in an open lot, and that's where the Moody Crusade was being held that night. And so he made the call there, hurried back, and got in just before Moody got up to preach. He was standing at the back, and they called him the man to lead the prayer, and the man prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, just kept on praying, and he got disgusted and told him to leave, leave. Now you want to know what kind of guy Moody was, how wise a man he was. He jumped up, and right in the while this guy's praying, he said, while our brother finishes his evening devotions, let's sing a song. Well, Grenfell was just stopped in his tracks. He was headed out of the tent. He was just stopped in his tracks, captured by that. He stayed and he was saved in the invitation of that service. <laughs> he later went out to Labrador, the frozen wastes of Labrador. It's an incredible story. If you ever get that book in your hands, read it. Incredible story. The things that happened and the ways God used him. Here's what he said. Now, I want to encourage you to write this down also. He said, God himself, now think of that, that's a reflexive phrase, God himself, it emphasizes that even God cannot, God himself cannot save the world without us. God himself cannot save the world without us. If souls are not saved, God himself cannot save the world without us. If souls are not saved, it must be because he cannot save them by himself. If souls are not saved, it must be because he cannot save them by himself. Now, let me give you two other illustrations. If you read any early church history, you'll run many times of this man's name. His original name was Ignatius. But he changed his name when he became a Christian to Christophorus. <clears throat> and they put him on trial, trying him for his life because of his faith in Christ. And the first question they ask him is, why did you insult your parents who gave you your name and violate the name they gave you and accept an alien name altogether? See, this name, watch, means Christ carrier. And that was his answer. He said, because the day I was born again, I became a carrier of the living Son of God. And I wanted to take a title that would show my vocation. Now, that's the vocation of every Christian. He has to be a Christ carrier. The very meaning of that name. In fact, this is the reason, this is the bottom line reason Queen Isabella sent out Columbus. Mm -hmm. See, there was an extreme debate. He could not rouse enough resources anywhere. <coughs> he tried in several places to make the trip he wanted to make. And she would have rejected him, apparently, had it not been for his first name. She said, if there are really heathen, if there are really other lands that are populated by people, and they would be heathen, then the message must be taken to them. And she deployed him. The final <coughs> boat was cast because of his first name, Christ carrier, Christopher. Of course, it's a Roman Catholic situation. Excuse me. He was Jewish too. He was. I didn't. I didn't remember that. But anyway, that was the reason. So uh, she deployed him because of the name, because of his name. Very interesting thing. So. There's a spiritual concept here. Jesus has to have carriers. Now, that raises a question. Why doesn't he have more carriers? Well, in this case, the donkey has to get down low enough so the rider can mount. And if we don't get down low enough, he can't mount. So he doesn't have carriers simply because the donkeys are playing their own game instead of his. All right, here's a second thing here. This text clearly shows us or suggests the spiritual characteristics of Jesus' characters, of Jesus' characters. The spiritual characteristics of Jesus' characters. There are three of them, and boy, they loom in the 
the story. You're not inventing anything here. You're just turning this, the picture into a symbol of statement of Jesus' characters. Okay, let me give you the three characteristics. The first one is lowliness. It is incredible to me to consider the animal that he rode. Verse 5. It was not a horse. A horse is a military animal. It's not a camel. A camel is a merchant's animal. It's not an Arabian steed, it's a monarch's animal. The Arabian steeds were bred for, for place in the king's stables. So it wasn't a horse, military animal, a camel, merchant's animal, or an Arabian steed, a monarch's animal. It was a common beast of burden. Someone called it the poor man's horse. What that suggests to me is that anybody qualifies if he's willing to get low enough. F.B. Meyer said, I used to think you had to climb the ladder and meet God at the top of the ladder. And then I realized you had to fall off the ladder and hit the bottom because God's been waiting on you down there all the time. <laughs> Write down this verse. This is one of the most challenging verses in the Bible to me. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. So far in the verse, strife is cutting other people down. Vain glory is building yourself up. And usually those go together. The person strangely feels that he has to knock other people down to build himself up. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Here's the key word. But in lowliness of mind. Each esteem others better than themselves. Now, I, I doubt there's a person in this room that thinks anybody else in this room is better than himself. But that's not what this is about. I don't think you're better than me, but I have to count you better than me. It's a lifetime vocation. That's what it says. In lowliness, lowliness of mind, let each esteem or count the others better than himself. In other words, you defer to your brothers. That's a challenging vocation. It's impossible without a work of the Spirit. Why? Because we're all self-conscious, self-centered individuals. We don't easily de defer to anybody else. I want to promise you something. You will never make disciples unless your focus of attention gets off of yourself onto the other person. This won't happen. And if a person is always crowding with his own self-conscious, every consciousness, everything, without the center of gravity shifting from him to the other person, he will never make disciples. Now here is a giant wall. This word in Philippians 2-3, translated loneliness, it's exactly in Greek, letter by letter, except for the ending. It's the word that gives us our English word tapestry or carpet. To be walked on. Yeah, to be walked on. But not because not because he's uh, he courts that. It's rather that he's willing to be. See that? How did Jesus get himself crucified? He was willing to be walked on. Because he realized some people just have to step on somebody else to be able to even see God. <coughs> and, and so we're to get down low enough. Here's another interesting factor. The word humility comes from the Latin word. And by the way, Philippians 2 is the greatest chapter in the Bible on humility. I mean, it is a ringer on humility. And humility is a very elusive factor. Perhaps the most important single thing, it, it is the anti-pride state of mind, and pride is the anti-God state of mind. And so this is absolutely crucial, and this comes from a Latin word that has come over into our society, the word humus, dirt, earth, soil, humus. And this is the same root word from which we get the word 
human. In other words, there is no true human being who does not have humility that will allow him to be loose from himself and bound to God. Ian Thomas was right. There is no true man without God. You're less than true man if you're without God because you're made for God. That's just the way it's written. So all of this is tied together. It means just like that lowly beast, we've got to get down if he's going to be carried. And it's very difficult to get down low enough to let him mount. Write down one last, one last thing under that first characteristic, and then we'll go to the second one. The gospel chariot is always drawn only by donkeys. See, that offends the pride of man. It's designed to. God's not out to hurt your pride. He's out to kill it. <laughs> and you don't lose anything. <laughs> you gain. So, the first characteristic is lowliness. Right, here's the second characteristic of, of, of uh, Jesus' character. Second characteristic is liberty. You won't carry Jesus without freedom. Now, this is in verse 2. Loose him, set him free, and bring him to me. In other words, Jesus could not use that donkey unless it was set free. Unless the times that tied it to the hitching post were untied. When they arrived, the donkey was tied up. And when Jesus arrived in our lives, so were we. We were bound. I mean bound. Bound by the sins of the flesh, bound by evil habits, bound by an ugly disposition, bound by jealousy or pride or conceit, any one of a number of things, fear, frustration, discouragement, some of us are still bound, at least moderately so. Now there were two things that bound that donkey. outer bonds, the ropes that tied him to the hitching post, but there was a bigger one, his own inner beastliness. He, one of the gospels says he was a, a, a donkey on which never man had sat, so he's unbroken. Now this corresponds to all the circumstantial things that prevent us from being freed by God and free to him and him and his purpose. This corresponds to the flesh each one of us carries. So this is on the outside, objective to us. This is on the inside, subjective to us. And both of those bind us until we're set free. Let me give you an illustration of this one. This is an incredible story. It would be well worth reading Gulliver. Gulliver's Travels in order just to get the story. In Gulliver's Travels, you remember this normal-sized Englishman. It's a satire, and he was on a world trip, and he came to a coastal area that housed a colony of tiny little people called Lilliputians. And he was afraid of them because there were so many of them, and they were, they were unpredictable, they were unknown, and they were afraid of him because he was so big. And so they started trying to communicate down on the beach. And they got closer and closer and closer and thought they were making headway. And so night came that night and they went back to their place. He laid down on the beach to sleep. And when he woke up the next morning, he could not move anything but his eyes and his mouth. Because here's what they had done during the night. They silhouetted his body with, with stakes that were about the size of toothpicks. They took threads and marched across his body, tied one to the toothpick driven into the ground here, marched across his body and tied it to the toothpick over here. And they silhouetted his body with thousands of threads all up and down and around. And when he woke up the next morning, if there had only been one, he could have easily broken it. But there were a thousand of them, and he couldn't move anything but his mouth and his eyes. Now, when I read that, boy, it just lunged into my mind. What a picture. 
picture of the Christian who is tied down to the earth by a thousand little springs. And he will never serve God unless he's set free. Just like that donkey. The outer bonds tied it to the hitching post. It could not get to Jesus unless someone set it free. And in this story, that would be the responsibility of the assigned Christian, just like uh, Jesus told uh, the attendants at the tomb of Lazarus, loose him and let him go. Jesus didn't take the grave clothes off. He told his friends to take the grave clothes off. So we need to help each other to be free. Then the inner beastliness is compounded by the fact that this was a wild animal. I don't remember where I was teaching. I was teaching about this story right here in a different light. And a, a young farm boy came up to me afterwards and he said, tell me that part of the story again. And when I finished, he said, my, what wonderful hands Jesus must have had <laughs> to control wild beast, a wild donkey. Uh, some of you know a whole lot more farms about farms than I do. But I was told by a farmer that if you take a wild stallion and tie it to a donkey and release them, that stallion will drag that donkey away. But two days later, they'll come back and the donkey will be dragging the stallion. <laughs> <laughs> and here's Jesus riding a donkey on, on which never man has sat in other words, there was a breaking instantly, however it happened. So there has to be liberty. Here's the third thing. Third characteristic is the donkey had better be prepared for labor. And I mean strenuous labor. Think of the weight of a full-grown 30-plus year old man on a foal of a donkey. And the strain and the struggle and the effort and the surrender of rights that that animal had to come to. In other words, carrying Jesus involves a lot of heaviness. And there's just no way to get around it. The, the rewards are far greater than the responsibility. But without fulfilling the responsibility, you'll never come to the rewards. Years ago, I read a favorite book. It was one of the most encouraging documents I ever read. It was a book by Tim Hansel, Hansel entitled Holy Sweat. And in the introduction, here's what he says. He says, holy is what we're to be, and sweat is how we get there. Let me say it again. Holy is what we are to be. In other words, don't fool yourself to think that this is a free ride where you climb up on the altar and just lie passive. You cooperate and you give effort as God gives effort. You match His effort. And that doesn't mean the stress is on you to do it, the stress is on you to cooperate. Somebody said the Christian life is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. I had a seminary professor who said if you're looking for a soft spot in the ministry, start by feeling the top of your head. <laughs> it's just not there labor. And we shouldn't expect it. Nobody vocationally should expect anything that puts him outside the camp of labor. Because that's the way it is. One of the problems in this nation is we've lost our work ethic. Mm -hmm. So those are the three characteristics of Jesus carriers. Lowliness, had to get down, be a poor man's horse, let him ride. Liberty, have to be free from the outer circumstantial bonds and the inner flesh, and then labor, you have to be willing to sweat and strain for him to be carried. And here's the last thing. Third thing. The story clearly shows us the spiritual consequences that occur when Jesus can find carriers. spiritual consequences. This is in verse 10. Gigantic verse. Look at what happened. When he came into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. 
saying, who is this? So here are the two consequences. Number one, Christ is manifested when he can find carriers. How would you like to see Jesus become the talk of the city of Memphis? So Christ was manifested everywhere. They kept on asking, who is this? And they kept on answering in perfect tense verbs. They kept on answering, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. So Christ was manifested. He became the buzz talk of the town. And here's the bigger one yet. It literally says the city was moved. Christ was manifested and the entire city was moved. And here's a giant wallop. That word translated moved in the middle of verse 10. Minor emphasis. It's the Greek word earthquake. Uh huh? Uh huh? Is it earthquake? Yeah, it's, it's the word we get our word. It's a derivative from it, or it's a foundational word. It's based on the word seismos. That's the word from which we get seismograph. It's a word for it's actually not an earthquake. A it's reading. a quake. A it's any kind of quake. What you got here, you ready? Is a Christ quake. <laughs> How'd you like to see in Memphis move by that? We're on an earthquake fault. Hmm. But why don't we correct that and ask God for a Christ quake? Oh, hey. Well, Dawson Trotman said. Christians are peculiar people. They play. They pray for baubles when they ought to be asking for continents. Now let that register. We pray for trinkets when we ought to be asking for continents. Why don't we ask God to shake this city? I mean shake it. Or God shakes it. Now it may mean a physical earthquake. That's okay. <laughs> if I die in it, that's okay. If God gets in business that way. See? So... The idea here is, says the whole city quaked. That's the exact word that was used, that's used here. And the Phillips paraphrase says, a shock ran throughout the whole city. Another translation says, and the city was shaken, and it's, and it's minor emphasis, heavily shaken. So everybody was brought to a crisis. What are we going to do with him? Are we going to receive him or reject him? What are we going to believe about him? What are we going to think about him? God forced the issues. Now, write down a few final principles. One in particular. Jesus carrying always produces movement. That's not for the carrier or the thing carrying, or the one being carried. It's for the things around it. Jesus carrying always produces movements. day Jesus recruited a donkey named Paul and the Christian movement started. <clears throat> One day Jesus recruited a donkey named Martin Luther and the Reformation began. One day Jesus recruited a donkey named John Wesley and the Methodist movement started <coughs> which saved England from the impact of the French Revolution, the bloodbath of the French Revolution. It was only 40 miles away coming that way fast and hard. And Wesley, God raised up Wesley and cast him outside the church so that he would preach on the hillsides and countrysides and in the fields. <clears throat> and that saved England from the bloodbath of the French Revolution. A donkey named John Wesley. Jesus recruited a donkey named Hudson Taylor and the China, you ever think about this? All the missionaries prior previous to that in history that had gone to China were coastal missionaries where it was comfortable. He went to the interior where it was extremely dangerous. And, and in the course of time, through the China Inland Mission, God sent over a thousand missionaries into inland China, 250 of which preceded Hudson Taylor and Taylor in death, and every one of them were martyred. That's a pretty big movement. Because he found a donkey named Hudson Taylor. <coughs> he found a donkey named William Booth, and the Salvation Army movement was born. It was born actually in the church with Catherine sitting up in the gallery of the balcony, and they rebuked him for, for being parachurch.
church and they told him if he would come back to the pulpit of the church they would endorse him and his wife stood up and called out from the balcony don't do it William don't do it and the Salvation Army was born because God, God uh, recruited a donkey named William Booth get this in a cemetery led to Christ by an old white haired Baptist preacher who had just been fired from the church next to the cemetery taken his key away and he couldn't even get back in the building. That preacher heard eight kids come in the archway of the cemetery that day. They were just coming in to play and he was weeping, sitting on a tombstone. He dried his eyes, called those guys over, sat them down on the grass, got behind the pull-up, got behind the, the, the uh, tombstone and turned that death place into a place of life. And William Carey was born of God in that graveyard that morning and became the father of the modern missionary. Jesus recruited through an old washed out Baptist preacher who thought his ministry was over. I wonder you what he thinks of him yes. today. God used him to recruit a donkey named William Carey. William Carey went out to India and the work is absolutely unbelievable that he did there. Tra translate the Bible into seven different languages in India. And it took him years to make his first convert. Then they came so fast he couldn't keep up with it all. One day recruited a 16 year old donkey named Bob Biney Jesus wrote him into my life about you about the somebody else that's waiting for Jesus to be carried for you for me so I guess and if this is seen I mean this in the best possible way my invitation is that all of us will just go out and make asses out says and bring them unto me All right, I would guess the reason is the coat won't go easily unless the mother is brought right. so they bring the mother and the coat just follows along easily I would guess that's the reason for that and uh, it says verse 7 says they brought the ass and the coat and put on them their clothes and they set him their own so I, I, I would guess the mother is there to make the coat accessible all the way through and it sounds like, and I don't, I don't have any reason to not believe this, agree with this, they put the garments on both of them. Um, it may just be the NIV translation, Jesus sat on them. He had it, they have it in the plural. On the clothes, on the clothes. No, the clothes are put on them. Okay. Yeah, he said on them, he said on the clothes. Let me give you a last okay. clincher, some clincher illustration. Mission, a missionary to India told this story. He said he was out witnessing on the streets. And he came to a, an untouchable road sweeper, an outcast, a member of the lowest class, the untouchables. And he gave him a, a little partial copy, a copy of a partial New Testament. And when his way came back later, and the man stopped him read that and wanted to talk to him and so they got together and he led this road sweeper to Christ.
Christ. And he began to disciple him, growing, encouraging, building, teaching. And the road sweeper began to preach out on the streets. At first he had a dozen people stop and listen to him, and soon he was having hundreds of people. Hundreds of people were being saved. And the missionary pulled him aside one day and said, please explain this to me. He said, you're not nearly as well equipped as I am. You don't have the capability to communicate that I have. Why is God using you like that? And he said, the road sweeper said, I just read this story about Jesus being carried by a donkey. <coughs> he said, apparently nobody kept paid any attention to that donkey before Jesus met. And when Jesus got off, you never hear the donkey again. He said, the reason they pay attention to me is because of who I'm carrying. <laughs> and that would be the same thing true of us. When it's all over and the judgment comes, we'll only wish that we've been carriers. And that's all. Because Amen. that's where all accolades at the judgment seat of Christ Amen. are coming from. And it should be that way. And we are just good donkeys. <coughs> Anybody else? Uh, explore this, put in your notes, to draw an analogy here between that donkey and a pregnant woman carrying another life. Think of what that pregnant woman does to protect that life and deliver that life, and that's exactly what a Christian is supposed to do in carrying Jesus. She protects herself. She eats differently. She thinks differently. She accommodates the life in her. She looks for the delivery. And then she develops what happens after the delivery. Just like the carrier of Jesus is to be. We're, so we're to be like Mary, carrying Jesus to the point of release. Worth the price of the mission. What well, you know, write down one more thing. I've, I've got notes all over the place here that just keep coming. A donkey does not determine its own course if it's ridden. It doesn't determine its own course, it doesn't determine its own cargo, it doesn't determine its own pace. doesn't determine its own disciplines. It doesn't determine its intake of food and water. <clears throat> it doesn't even determine its own destination if somebody is writing it. So just check those off. Is my course being determined by my writer? Am I willing to defer the weight of the cargo to his choice, not mine? <clears throat> wow. Am I willing to let him set the cadence for my pace? Am I willing to have him impose the disciplines and determine the destination? And by the way, I should be more concerned about getting him and other people to the destination than I am myself, because that's guaranteed. Am I willing to let him determine resources and operate by <clears throat> this is a big story. Well one of the things that and halfway in jet but not really when we have a young people, young man elected a deacon, one of the things I've always asked, what is the name of the donkey Jesus rides to town? That's good. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, well, somebody said it's amazing. But they look for it in every place. They say it's amazing what a Christian can do if he doesn't care who gets the credit. Now we know the answer. Just donkeys. Yeah. Now we know the answer. Well, there are a lot of illustrations of this. Uh, I think, let me see, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Here we go. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Uh, Now that was an interesting couple I was stopped and delayed with downstairs. Really? They're, they're, they're looking for the English? Well, they had been, no. They had been, they come for the evangelism. Uh, 
And they are a rain. I was in an infestation of Iraqis and Iranian Farsi speaking people in Brussels, Belgium. It was very, very interesting. We spoke like at the United Nations. I spoke to six lingual groups at one time because they were in, the translators were in sound booths receiving it and they would speak it and come out in earphones. So everyone had the earphones and heard it, heard it in his own language. And I'll be very disappointed, thank you. If we get to the judgment, I don't find somebody was saved there that day because it was an anointed time. We couldn't give an invitation. This wasn't a wise thing to do. But they were there every time, every session. And we weren't teaching the gospel. Do you know, I taught this very study. This will blow you away. First Baptist Church of Detroit. No, First Baptist Church of Florianopolis, South Brazil. We had 39 people saved in the service, and this is not an evangelistic message. Mm. <laughs> it's just a regular service to them. They had 39 people saved, and we were going out, and they had to go out and walk down steps, a long set of stairways to get out of the building that way, and I was at the door, and people were shaking hands and couldn't speak English. One guy came by, and don't forget this. Here's what he said. He pointed at me. <laughs> uh, is that vivid? But I want to, I want to carry him. I want him to be on me, and I want to carry him. I'll never forget that he went like this. Mm -hmm. Man, I know I'm saved, but after tonight, if I could be, I'd be saved again. <laughs> <laughs> me too. It'd be almost worth getting lost. <laughs> 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 